Um, this is our last webinar. It's a very special webinar in the PTD summer webinar series that we initiated um, this year to compensate a bit for um, the panels at the PSA that could not take place due to the pandemic. Um, it's a special format today. It's the last webinar, but it's the first official book launch that we're doing on the Handbook of Democratic Innovation and Governance. And it's, I think it's also our, our very first book launch that takes place in a digital space. So a lot of firsts today. Um, we're really glad to co-launch this book with Oliver Escobar and Stephen Elstop today, who are going to be chairing um, the session in a minute. Um, I think it's one of the most comprehensive and encompassing volumes on um, democratic innovations and governments that I saw so far. It's addressing various topics such as what are democratic innovations and governance at all and how far are they able to address contemporary democratic challenges, what are relevant actors, what's the role of democratic innovations in policy making, what's the role around the world and how can we re research them in the end. So, we're very curious um, and we're very excited to have you here um, and to hear more about this handbook um, and um, about your discussions um, with practitioners and researchers right now. Anastasia? Yes. So uh, a warm welcome from me as well. So we thank you, uh, Oliver and Stefan, all the, the presenters that you have accepted this invitation. Because as uh, Danica said, that's very important that we're going to have this book launch online in, in our series of webinars. I think it's already a reference point in our discipline and I'm sure it's going to be a great discussion on that. Uh, on my behalf, just to remind and to um, let other people know of our uh, other activities. So we have uh, a picture contest, which is called uh, Reimagining Democracy and is, is running until the end of uh, September. We are accepting uh, submissions. It's open to graduate and PhD students or early career researchers. Uh, so the whole uh, rationale is to uh, visualize, to imagine, and try to make this uh, an image, how democracy is in your own terms, and uh, provide also a short uh, description of that. We're gonna have 150 pounds vouchers, book vouchers for three winners that are going to be selected by a jury and also by public vote because we're a participatory research group. So uh, we want your input as well. Uh, on another note, uh, we have uh, launched the call for papers for our PDD section at the Political Studies uh, Association conference in 2020, uh, yeah, 2021 on the conference on resilience, expertise and hope. Um, let's hope that this is going to be a live and not online conference, but let's see. I think they will accommodate a kind of blended conference for this year. Let's see how things will go. So we are um, inviting uh, paper proposals or panel proposals, and we'll be very glad to listen to your own opinions or ideas or roundtables or all this kind of uh, format. So the deadline is uh, on Wednesday, it's 13th of September. I will circulate um, our email to the chat button. And we are always open to your ideas and contributions uh, of this group. Uh, we were very happy for this series of uh, webinars. And since I, I will have to leave a little bit earlier, uh, before the end of this webinar, because uh, that's an urgent project call. So I would like to thank all of you for your participation in these uh, webinars, for the great, uh, vibrant discussions we had on a number of uh, topics. And the fact that I think, at least in my opinion, I think the other convener's opinion that it was a very productive online uh, space for discussions on our uh, participatory and deliberative democracy research. So that's for me for now. I think we hand over to Oliver right now and Stephen, it's your turn. Great, great. So I'll get going. Um, so I can't begin to tell you all how excited we are to be doing this. Um, it's been some time coming. Um, this was scheduled to happen. The, the launch of the book was scheduled to happen in the last spring, where we were going to be hosting 
and the Political Studies Association Conference at Edinburgh Uni, but then history happened, uh, and here we are a few months later, um, having the chance to launch the book in a way that probably we do them uh, otherwise, as in, you know, with access for people who uh, are joining us from uh, all sorts of interesting places. Um, I'm speaking from Edinburgh. It would be really nice if you can let us know in the chat where you are just now, just to give us a sense of the geographic spread of this conversation. So please do let us know. Um, and uh, we are gonna keep an eye on the chat as well to try and make sure that I put all the questions to um, to the panelists and also to Steven. Today I'm gonna be wearing my facilitator hat, although I might um, come in at some point as well with some of my views on some of the issues, but uh, we're particularly interested to hear what the panel members have to say. Um, let me bring up a little uh, a slide just to uh, give us all the chance as well to um, engage via Twitter, if you like to do that kind of thing. Um, and I, I suppose, I, well, I should say I'm Oliver Escobar. I'm at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, I've been working with Stephen on this book for since 2016 now. Um, and Stephen will introduce himself in a second. He's going to give us an overview of, of the handbook. Um, the, uh, I think, Obviously, democratic innovation is arguably as old as democratic practice is. Um, but I think it's fair to say that in the last 10 years, since Graham Smith published his book on democratic innovations, uh, that book helped to galvanize an emerging field of theory and practice. And this is one of the exciting elements of this hybrid field. Um, is, is very vibrant in terms of the ongoing conversation be, between research and practice. And we hope that the handbook captures a little bit of that. Um, the book took three years to make and um, it has 60 contributors. Uh, it has a global scope. Um, you will hear a little bit more detail from Stephen in a second. And I'll also be posting on the chat some links so that you can go to the open access chapters uh, so that you can go also and get the book if, if you want to do that. Uh, we want to acknowledge everyone who contributed, but uh, we would need the entire session if we want to list everyone who helped us along the way. We're extremely thankful, of course, to the 60 co-authors of the handbook, our families, our partners, um, our colleagues at work. Um, these things don't happen unless you have a strong community behind, uh, and the community of, uh, of the field of democratic innovation has been very supportive in many ways. Um, the format for this session is going to be fairly straightforward. We are going to um, start with a quick overview, around 10 minutes, uh, from uh, Stephen. Uh, then we are going to move on to getting some um, reflections from our panel members. We're extremely thankful to them. I'll introduce them properly after Stephen uh, gives us the overview. Um, I need to say that Kayla Scott couldn't come, so she sent apologies, um, but we have a stellar panel um, and it should be, uh, we're looking forward to hearing what they have to say. And um, we are hoping as well to be challenged um, for some of the legitimate critiques that need to be made of this field and perhaps of the approach we've taken to the handbook. Uh, we're really keen to engage with those things. Um, and then we will have a little bit of a, um, an opportunity to reply to some of the questions and challenges that might come from the panel, and then we will open it up uh, so that you can contribute either by turning on your microphone or uh, by just adding stuff to the chat, and I'll keep an eye on it and try and make it work. Uh, we're gonna be really, really efficient, hopefully with time, um, aided by a bunch of um, sun clocks that are gonna keep us on track, and I'll uh, try and make sure that we protect the time for the Q&A and the discussion towards the end. Um, and you, by now, I think most people might be familiar with how Zoom works. The chat, um, as you know, um, can be accessed just by hovering at the bottom of the at the bottom of the screen and and bringing it up. And then you can also go to the participants list and raise your hand if you want to speak. I can explain that later again. Um, 
I think the last thing I want to say is that um, it, it, this is a, a really peculiar time, isn't it? Because on the one hand, democratic innovation is flourishing all over the world. At the same time, um, democracies are being tested um, by a number of challenges. Uh, and what's at stake, uh, at least from my perspective, is how we configure our institutional democratic system for the governance of the future. Um, that's the challenge of our generation. It's a challenge that um, uh, I, I think many people are trying to address on the ground. Um, it's not easy. We're trying to um, reform, reinvent, reimagine uh, systems that in, in many ways have been entrenched and, and path dependent on a number of um, institutional choices made over decades, in some cases centuries. But it is an exciting field. And I, have, I, I think the panel perspectives will, will show um, some of the stuff that is happening on the ground. That's uh, all I'm gonna say for now. I'm just gonna stop the screen share and I'm gonna hand over to Steven. Please do um, uh, go to Twitter and um, also let us know what you think via that. I'll be checking up later and, and replying and you have there the handles for uh, panel members and, and also the, the hashtags uh, so that we can all link up in there. So welcome, please do keep the conversation going in the chat. And now I'm going to hand over to Stephen to give us a, an overview. Okay, um, can you see my screen? Yeah, right. Um, thanks, Oliver, and uh, welcome to um, all of you. It's great to uh, see so many of you here. Um, so many familiar faces, it's lovely. Um, I'd like to thank um, the, the specialist group for giving us the, uh, uh, the, the space to talk about our handbook, that's much appreciated. I'd like to thank our, our panel of speakers and, and most of all I'd like to thank uh, the chapter authors. I think uh, many of you are, are on the webinar, so hi and, and thanks again Oliver and I owe you a, a great debt. But I'm going to uh, move on and give a, a a sort of fairly brief overview about the handbook um, before we hear the responses from the panel. And really what we wanted to do was to capture um, what was going on with democratic innovations in, in theory and, and practice um, across the globe really. But we didn't want to just capture, we were keen to push the boundaries of um, the discipline as well. And the context that we um, that we see and, and writing about um, democratic innovations is the global democratic recession. I won't go into much detail on this. It's something that's familiar with with many of the people on this webinar. But I'll, I'll say a few brief words. So it's the decline in trust that we've seen in um, democratic institutions, especially the established ones. It's the increase in dissatisfaction with how democracy is actually operating and, and uh, it, the practice of democracy, if not though, with the, the faith in the idea of democracy still remains. But in this vacuum then, we've seen the rise of authoritarian um, populism, which then in itself brings um, challenges to democracy. And it's in this context that we see um, an increase in democratic innovations. So what we were trying to address in the book is, is what are they and how can they help and how's best to use them in order to help. So firstly, what are they? So Oliver and I felt that the, while there were a number of definitions out there already that we reviewed, um, we, we felt there was scope to, to, to improve. Um, we define democratic innovations as processes or institutions that are new to a policy issue, policy role or level of governance. De developed to reimagine and deepen the role of citizens in governance processes by increasing opportunities for participation, deliberation, and influence. So we think the strengths of this definition are that it, um, it captures the fact that a lot of democratic in innovation occurs in governance outside of political spheres, that quite often these are processes, they're not as established and, and concrete as um, institutions, and that they are new, and we try and set out what 
context that newness counts and matters and that they're good. It's, there's a normative aspect to it. it. It's suggested in the word innovation that we, we, we're benefiting from this and we try and clarify what that benefit might be in a, in a normative level. So we then go on to um, provide the typology of democratic innovations and we establish four different families of participatory budgeting, mini publics, collaborative governance, uh, referenda and citizens initiatives. Uh, we look also look at digital participation throughout the book as well, but we don't see that that classifies as a family of its own. Uh, and this is because basically our, our typology, first of all, is um, democratic innovations have a core. That's the de basic definition that I've um, uh, just told you about. You need to meet those criteria in order to be classified as a democratic innovation. But we did then go further and we distinguish between the different um, families of democratic innovation in terms of how participants are selected, how they participate, how they come to a decision and the level of power and authority that that decision will have. That's how we distinguish between the, the, the families that we just outlined. And we distinguish between cases in terms of the policy area they might be involved in, the level of governance, uh, stage of the policy process. There are obviously lots of other different ways to distinguish between types of democratic innovation and, and cases of democratic innovation, but we see these as the most important significant ones. So uh, a little bit about the structure. So it's divided into six sections and 39 chapters. So section one looks at the uh, the types of democratic innovation that I've just outlined. It's where Oliver and I outline our definition and typology. And we have a chapter as well that looks at the, how democratic innovation relates to different theories of democracy. Section two talks about democratic innovations in relation to the democratic malaise that I've just been talking about, and specifically how they can increase trust, how, what they can do about anti-politics, can they promote accountability, can they promote um, efficacy. Section three, reviews of different um, actors that are involved in democratic innovations, facilitators, consultants, public servants, experts, advocates, politicians and journalists. Section four, policy and governance, looks at the policy process different policy areas such as science and technology, social policy, environmental governance, constitutional reform, and global governance. And um, we then look at, in section five, democratic innovations around the world with chapters on uh, various different continents, different parts of the world. Section six then looks at different ways of researching democratic innovations and, and the different methods that can be used from quantitative, qualitative, mixed experiments, the discourse quality index and deliberative transformative moments, Q method and comparative studies. And then finally, we're, we're very pleased that um, Graham Smith, who sort of, who, whose book on democratic innovations has inspired Oliver and I's work and many people's work in this area, and provides a reflection on, on the handbook, but also the state of the field of democratic innovations um, and perhaps um, what the future holds. So to conclude, um, what does research today and the handbook that reviews and um, adds to this research and democratic innovations uh, show? Firstly, that democratic innovations can make it into democracy citizens and community to complex make informed decisions. Also of different in democratization, one of the key causes of that and contributors to that is um, digital participation. So hybridization is the mixture of different types. Those types I um, outlined earlier, they're not pure standalone types. We see combinations of, of, of them and we see different cross-cutting features that that's um, on the increase. So there's more hybridization. Also see more institutionalization. Um, so the connection of democratic innovations to political, established political institutions. And with that is coming a professionalization, a whole industry that delivers democratic um, innovations. 
I'm also seeing the scaling up while democratic innovations still occur a lot at the local level, we're seeing increasing um, levels of um, democratic innovations at different levels of governance, including at the national level as well. And with these trends come some, some important challenges. There's one of co-option. So democratic innovations can be used very benignly um, and to give a, a veil of democratic legitimacy rather than giving any meaningful full power to the citizens, which is obviously one of our conditions that that, that, that sort of should be happening. And um, so there's a danger there. And that danger is exacerbated by, I think we're seeing a lot of political opportunists um, with democratic innovations that are advocating them for their own um, interests rather than because of the, the contribution they'll make to democracy. So a good example of this would be the calls for citizens assemblies um, around Brexit when um, I, I may be proved wrong, those people may go on to call for citizen assemblies on, on, on a number of other issues as well, but it struck me that they were obviously very keen not to leave the European Union and saw sort of citizen assembly as the, as the last throw of the dice to try and make that happen, as opposed to um, they really believed we desperately needed a citizen assembly on, on this issue. Um, and, and just in general, that um, as they becoming more, as we're seeing more de democratic innovations, their profile is, is raising. With that, is becoming perhaps excessive expectation. We have to be realistic about what they can and, and can't achieve. Um, they can't save democracy alone. They can't stop that democratic recession that we talked about at the beginning by themselves. They can make a contribution. And what the handbook is about is trying to understand exactly what that contribution might be and how to combine them with other processes, other institutions, other phenomena that we might also require to um, improve democracy. So that's the aim of the handbook. Thank you. Great. Let me give you a little Zoom applause. Thanks, Estero. That's great. Um, yeah, we're going to move on to the panel. I'm very conscious as well that some of the uh, co-authors of the handbook are here today, so I'm hoping that they will chip in through the chat and perhaps later in the Q&A. And uh, it is thanks to the generosity that the volume um, was made possible. So, so thanks again to all of them. Um, but because the PSA conference, where this was going to be launched, was happening in Edinburgh, and there's a bit of a, a, a wave of democratic innovation happening in Scotland in the last 10 years. We wanted to, to do this very first launch uh, in collaboration with practitioners, with democratic innovators who are trying to take these ideas into, uh, turn these ideas into practices. Um, and therefore, we are, we are delighted to have um, three uh, very prominent democratic innovators differently situated in the institutional and civil society landscape. Um, what we are going to do now, we are going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes um, speaking to the panel, with the panel. Um, I've asked each panel member to tell us a little bit about their experience with democratic innovation and then any thoughts on the handbook. Of course, they were not expected to read the whole handbook. I don't know if anyone will ever read the full handbook with, besides Stephen and myself, who had to do it a few times. Um, but they were very kind and keen to actually read quite a few chapters. So we're looking forward to hearing from them whether they feel there are any missing elements and gaps uh, the extent to which it might or might not be relevant to their work, uh, how they might use it. Um, and then we've asked them as well to, to give us a challenge or a question that then we can address. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, by inviting uh, Kate Wimpress to, um, to get us going. Uh, Kate is the convener of the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. Uh, really uh, kind of, this is happening right now, this weekend, there was the first online session uh, of the assembly. The assembly have already met, met four times before. So it's gone from um, a face-to-face -face assembly to a digital assembly. Um, uh, so I imagine uh, Kate has quite a few things to share, but I'll have to uh, try and keep an eye on time. I'm gonna spend around five minutes with each of the panel members. 
um, starting with Kate. Uh, so welcome, Kate. Um, can you tell us a little bit um, about your experience with democratic innovation? Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, it really is a, a privilege to be here with um, people from all around the globe, which is an absolute joy. Um, and I have to, I have to start off by saying that I, I feel like I'm a, a kind of accidental practitioner in this field at the moment. I'm certainly not an academic, but it has been an absolute joy to learn from. Stephen Oliver um, and Kayla Scott, and I see Kelly McBride's here as well, and, and Graham Smith, obviously the, the kind of the um, uh, the innovator of the innovators, um, and David Farrell. So I've I've been on a very steep learning curve um, with this process. Uh, so I hope that anything I'll be able to pitch in today is of um, of, of benefit. But it, it feels very much as if I'm from the coal face, reporting back from the coal face. Uh, so please. Um, do uh, take that in mind. Um, but yeah, so I'm delighted to be here in Edinburgh, probably not very far away from yourself, Oliver. Um, and I, I just wanted to give a bit of a background to where we're at with the uh, the Scottish Assembly, so that we, we pull together, as, as you would expect, 100 um, people from across the country representative in terms of age, gender, socioeconomic class, educational qualifications, ethnic group, geography and political attitudes. Um, and, and as you rightly said, we met four times face to face, starting back in September uh, 2019. And then we had intended to um, finish the work in April of this year. But of course, um, the, the pandemic uh, kind of stymied that work um, completely. Um, but to set out our stall, the, uh, the assembly was looking at the, the kind of country we sought to build and um, how best we could overcome challenges Scotland were facing in the 21st century, um, including Brexit and, and laterally COVID, of course, and, and what further work um, should be carried out to give us the information we need to make informed choices. So we were you know, that's a, a ridiculously broad brief, really, um, and I'm sure there'll be many comments about that um, afterwards. But it was, a, it was a, a brief that the Assembly members, when they gathered, kind of took to task. And I think reading, reading the introduction to the handbook, where you say that, you know, people love democracy, but despair at how it is practised. I mean, that was, I, that was really a kind of a, a feeling and a sense that came across quite clearly when our citizens gathered and um, that they were uh, they were absolutely committed to this process but but somewhat despairing of what would happen at the end and where it would go and how it would kind of make that that um, longer term impact however um, we have been journeying hopefully on these four weekends and trying to uh, work through um, deliberative processes and spaces to ensure that we um, we're you know we're taking the authentic voice of this um, citizenship forwards, and I, and I think we were making some kind of progress. And of course, uh, then February, April, uh, February, March time, it became clear that we weren't going to gather again, and we've laterally made this shift online. And I think this is where I want to. Um, to kind of harvest the uh, the thinking of your um, of your very wide group because because this throws up another whole set of challenges and opportunities and uh, difficulties and um, pluses um, and I'm just I'm just wondering how this you know we're in a situation where this online world has happened and um, it's been externally forced upon us it's not something that we've chosen so but where can we find the fertile ground within um, your kind of uh, regular assembly moving online and, and how can we use this um, this challenge as a, as a total opportunity to get to, to the end of our work. Um, so just to, to give a summary, the, um, the assembly members uh, talked about, a lot about values and about the vision of the country they wanted to see build and it kind of uh, circled around three key items that they wanted to unpack further. One, fair work and fair taxes, and uh, number two, a greener Scotland, and three, um, the citizen information and the improved decision making. And I think, the, you know, within the handbook, uh, I think the handbook is going to stay with us um, for the longer term because it's it's something we can dip in and out of and kind of um, uh, reflect. I can reflect against how I think things are going with this live assembly, against the learning and the um, the, the sharing within the handbook. Uh, but I just wanted to say 
two things that really resonated with me. One is that it's this whole idea of it being an interface and a meeting point, and that um, the idea that you one has to by by necessity travel hopefully with these things because because what you are doing is providing a, an interface and a meeting point, um, and that you you do have to try and balance out uh, that you could be overly critical. Um, and, and, and cynicism is, is so easy to kind of creep in, um, but, the, but to try and kind of uh, keep that space open. Uh, and, and the things, the, the challenges that, that Stephen, um, the challenges that Stephen summarized, uh, it, the, the co-option, the political opportunism and the excessive expectation. I think being at the, at the front of this and being in a live project, I think it's the excessive expectation is the thing that gives me the most, it keeps me, it keeps me awake at night because the, the pressure on it is so extreme that it's it's a bit like the, uh, you know, it's like the, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs and the pressure is so extreme on it that that actually the, the, the results are um, diminished because we're, people are just trying to wring out far too much from it um, completely unfairly given the, the citizens that are involved in it. And, and the last point I wanted to, to just pick up on, I'm sure I've, I've probably gone over time, is, is reading um, Graham's fantastic uh, reflections on the handbook. Um, I think the line that, that I want, well, you know, that it opens up a whole new raft of investigation is what would a participatory, what would participatory public authorities look like? And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, so that's where, that's where my thinking is going. It's like, right, well, this is one thing that could so easily be, um, you know, flavor of the month sidelined taken advantage of but but how if we played it fully through what would a what would a participatory public authority look like and I, uh, I think I'll leave that there that's great thank you so much Kate I wonder if you have a question or a challenge that you want to throw at us um, yeah yeah ab absolutely and, and the challenge is based around digital and um, so if so I know there's there's kind of every, there's wrestling about pros and cons of digital and not digital digital and, and I'm thinking okay so we've got this external force that has forced us into this um in landscape uh, what would the panel members and uh, the um, uh, extremely uh, kind of uh, detailed guests think are the key uh, what are the key things about an enforced digital landscape what can we harvest from it. Uh, productively um, based on previous uh, work. That's great, thank you. And I, I suspect that Chris Connolly, who will, will speak soon, might, might have some thoughts on that. Um, I should say that the point you made about, uh, you know, cynicism is, is one that really resonates. And this is, this is for me the challenge every year when we welcome a new cohort of students and practitioners into the university. How do we, um, teach and work through these things in ways that allow us to remain critical without becoming cynical. And it's a, it's a difficult line to thread. And um, I want to bring in, thanks Kate, that was, that was very, very helpful. Uh, I want to bring in now Ali Stoddart, um, who is uh, the Public Participation Specialist at the Scottish Parliament, and um, is going to offer some initial reflections on the handbook. Thank you very much. Uh, Oliver and, and Stephen and uh, everybody that contributed to this handbook. It's really great to see a collection of scholars coming together to, you know, theorize and explore uh, democratic innovation. And I feel that this type of political study is always something that links quite well to practice on the ground. And I think, in fact, I wouldn't be doing the job that I do now if I hadn't you know, um, and, you know, and have, wouldn't have been able to experiment with all the different democratic innovations I have throughout my career so far without being exposed to theorists like Pateman or uh, Habermas or on the opposite end of the scale, Downs or Schubiter uh, when I was studying in university. And rather embarrassingly, I noticed the professor Stephen Coleman is on the call. So hi, Stephen, I hope you're well. Um, uh, and thank you very much for uh, you know, introducing me to, to parts of this theory when I was at the University of Leeds. Um, but when I finished university, I, I started my uh, career at the organization called the Democratic Society. I think there's a few staffers on, on the line at the minute, and that's a nonprofit who works to create a more participative democracy. And I suppose they're there to kind of learn and, and uh, innovate and try things out in, in, in relation to democratic innovation. And I worked uh, with uh, councils and national governments and 
non-profit organizations to do things like participatory budgeting, digital engagement, you know, mm -hmm. deliberative processes and, you know, citizens initiatives, some of which are actually mentioned in, in the book. So it's kind of um, you know, slightly navel gazing, but it's quite nice to see sort of, you know, things that you've worked on even in a short period of time sort of um, being documented in that way. So I, I worked there for five years and I kind of learned my democratic innovation chops, uh, you know, at the coalface uh, doing all sorts of host of different interesting things that I've mentioned and are picked up on it in the in the book in terms of different types of things. And then there was a, a job came up at the Scottish Parliament, which was um, to be um, the participation specialist at a newly formed uh, committee engagement unit. And this was off the back of the uh, commission into parliamentary reform that the um, presiding officer set up to kind of have a kind of MOT of the parliament and have a look and see if it's, you know, achieving the things that it should be achieving based on its initial sort of founding principles. And, and one of the main kind of recommendations was to set up this unit in order to increase effective public participation, predominantly in the work of committees, um, because, you know, they need to have that connection between the people of Scotland. Um, and that has now involved me doing things like more like the day-to-day -day stuff, like improving engagement planning, ensuring that committees have sort of feedback loops. So when they are involving the public in processes, they can see, you know, what that, what that leads to. But then also when you talk about innovation, you know, embedding digital engagement and, you know, even deliberative processes, um, which we've recently just ran uh, a few uh, citizen juries, which I believe are like the first uh, in the world for a legislature institution to run in-house, uh, which was you know quite exciting and great to be part of uh, in in that in that respect. Um, I suppose the thing that I want to achieve within with the work is you know making a more participative parliament uh, that you. Know, experiments with all these different innovations and, and normal ways of doing things, I suppose, in order to involve, ensure that people are connected to their parliament, connected to their political representatives, and that those representatives can have access to the best evidence and indeed lived experience from experts and stakeholders, but also the, the people of Scotland in order for us to hold government uh, to account. I've been there for two years, and uh, now we're over two years now, uh, but this handbook's really helped me reflect on my practice and think about where things sit. I um, definitely think that the handbook is incredibly comprehensive. Uh, I paid particular attention to chapters on digital participation, uh, but also really like the chapters on accountability and, and policy making, and all of all of the stuff sort of compounded to show how varied the field of democratic innovation can be, which I suppose makes it quite challenging to study and to and to analyze. Um, especially as Stephen mentioned that, you know, there's so many things can be hybrids or combinations. So then you really don't know what a democratic innovation is and, and what it's not. Um, and I think, um, yeah, so that's important. So that's one thing I've picked up on. I think the main challenge I picked up is the kind of connection of democratic innovations being delivered, resulting in change or impact. And that's incredibly hard to measure. I say it's like, you know, pulling a string to find out where that citizen's input has had some sort of impact. And I think it was uh, Adrian's um, chapter that talked about Drysdale's transmission mechanisms. So how do we connect the public uh, to decision makers? And that's really, really, you know, important. But I mean, I've ran normatively well-received citizen duties, as I mentioned, for committees in the Scottish Parliament, uh, one on the kind of future of primary care and one on future funding of kind of land management in Scotland. But these are all for like, uh, maybe inquiries. It's not like directly linked to say legislation. I've done plenty of work on legislation, but these are all about inquiries. And those things don't really have like a wow moment. That's like, oh, whoa, like we've taken part in the citizen jury and now instantly there's this huge change. It's more like, you know, that's really interesting. This will help us look into other areas and, you know, eventually we'll have, you know, some sort of outcome. Uh, an example of that is I did some work ages ago around young people and mental health and we used an online platform to crowdsource you know young people's views on that for the public petitions committee and it was a year and a half later when those well considered thoughts actually became part and were heavily you know quoted and influenced in the outcome of that uh, of that piece of work but you know that's a, a longer game and i think in terms of that kind of payoff and impact that that's quite a big a big challenge. Um, so Ali, wh what is missing in the handbook or, um, you know, uh, any challenge that you might want to throw at us before I move on to Chris? Yeah, thanks for interrupting me because I could talk about this all day, so I do appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully I've said some relatively sensible things, but I think I think it was pointed up, I know uh, Graham's concluded chat has already been mentioned, but there is a kind of thing about looking at the starry things, you know, the, 
you know, the rosy sort of lovely examples of really big innovations. And I could point to work that I've done in the parliament, but what I'd probably be more interested in is how we measure the kind of boring everyday things that are still count as innovation because for parliament, digitizing your online, um, you know, digitizing your written submissions process is a big deal. It's not something that's easy. And um, we need to look at also just the everyday engagement we have with communities, not just big set pieces. And how are we gonna measure those activities to ensure the public are more uh, connected to political uh, institutions. That'd be my thank you, Ali. That is very helpful. And yeah, so Graham's chapter, which is I think chapter thirty-eight, uh, I believe, um, makes that point about you know uh, the current bias towards success in the field. And I think that that's something we are going to have to take very seriously. Um, others in the book make the case for more comparative work like Matt Ryan and, and, and others as well. Uh, so it's a really useful point to pick up. Um, I should say, I, I meant to show the book earlier. This is actually the book, the physical thing. Um, in, in a little bit, I'm gonna post some links on how you can get the ebook. Uh, and also uh, we got from the publisher a 35% discount um, to share with uh, uh, all of you today. Um, but I just wanna thank Ali and move to our final panelist now, uh, Chris Connolly, um, who is in the digital engagement team at the Scottish government. Hi, Chris. Hi, uh, hi. Um, thank you for having me here today. I feel a bit like a, an imposter <laughs> being invited. Um, but um, my journey with uh, all of this started seven years ago uh, when I joined, um, signed up for a master's in public policy with Oliver, actually. And he's guided me uh, to start working with the digital engagement team, which was a new team about six years ago in the Scottish government. And our remit is really to provide tools and guidance for policymakers to increase public engagement in policymaking. Um, and this was done through uh, digital consultation and online crowdsourcing. Um, so we began by transitioning formal consultations from a PDF buried in the bottom of a website and moved it online to improve access and transparency and really putting accessibility and user experience at the core of what we do. Um, so very recently, um, as part of a cross-government team, we delivered a public engagement exercise um, on COVID-19. Um, I think that this sort of embodies democratic innovation and in that given the unprecedented times, we had to respond quickly to what is the biggest health crisis of our time. So the first minister launched the framework on decision making and invited the public to contribute their ideas about how we can collectively tackle the virus. I think that's really important to say collectively and not just policymakers behind closed doors. Um, so in early May, we ran a week long pub public engagement crowdsourcing exercise in which we received over 4,000 unique contributions um, with 18,000 comments on those with nearly 12,000 people registered. So it was quite um, a, a big ambitious exercise for a, a very small team within government to, to deliver. Um, those responses were subsequently analyzed and used to inform the route map for easing lockdown restrictions. So we can say that this was done through a participatory method. Um, it was quite unique in terms of how quickly we had to adapt, um, respond and engage the public. Um, it was an open discussion really about the hopes and fears and a reminder that we're all in this together. It wasn't a typical consultation just focused on options appraisal. Um, and the ambition is really about hearing from people and working together to pave the way forward. So moving forward, my team's ambition is to continue to make decisions with people and not to make choices for them. And COVID's really forced us to move um, online as our traditional methods of, of engaging and gathering have been disrupted, whether that's through personal relationships, professional, um, or the way that government can access people. Um, so we had to, like online participation grew rapidly out uh, of this need and it looks like it's here to stay, although not to replace face-to-face -face engagement when that can resume. Um, the Scottish government has commitments to openness and transparency in the way that it operates, whether it's through the first minister wanting an open and accessible government, our open government action plan, our national outcomes, and most recently the World Health Organization criteria for public engagement. And we, like many others across the globe, are trying to explore what this means in action. And so we found some really useful resources through Participedia, which is referenced in, in the handbook throughout, 
um, and the open government partnership that are highlighting case studies around public sector response to, to COVID. Um, and we're just continuing to move towards a new normal and trying to do this with the people. And this handbook is an excellent resource in terms of identifying how we can connect with others um, and do this right. Chris, uh, there's yes. a question already for you, so I'm going to put it straight to you. All um, right. Rick, Ricky Ding um, is asking whether there's a link available. This is an easy question, I think. Is there a link available to the process that you have been describing so that people can read a little bit more about um, how this was uh, done? Yeah, absolutely. I've got, uh, I can send a link to the public engagement as well as to the uh, analysis and re reflections right. on it. So we'll do that in a second. And but before before um, we move on, is there a challenge or a gap or um, you know a, a perhaps an area for future work? Anything that you could suggest would uh, kind of help us move the field forward? Yeah. So uh, one of my challenges is that there's an absolute wealth of knowledge and resource in this. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how many pages offhand it is. But how do we get this handbook in the hands of policymakers and decision makers and actually start affecting change through good practice that this book handbook highlights? Great. So yeah, there is a real challenge in terms of knowledge brokering. We are conscious that there is, um, you know, there's a, a growing toolbox of guidance and toolkits, and there's a lot going on. And yeah, at some point, I think you are right that we are going to have to do some labor of synthesis that tries to get the best from both the research and the practice and, and, and try to create an easier entry point for those who are new to the field. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm going to um, give Stephen a chance perhaps to address um, some of the points that have come up, although I'm also very conscious that there are people in the group who might be able to take up some of those challenges. But let me start by giving Stephen a chance to, to reply on any of the three uh, questions or challenges that have come up. And then I'm going to start to uh, field questions from the chat. Uh, and also, please do put your hand up if you want to come in. We'll really love to hear from all of you, um, and you know, including the, the co-authors of the handbook, many of them um, present here. So Stephen, um, initial reactions to what you heard from the panel? Yeah, um, so firstly on the, the, the digital landscape, um, and, and this kind of relates to what Chris was saying as well about, you know, obviously with COVID-19, we've got um, moving to a digital public sphere. So understanding more about the digital landscape is increasingly important. We've also got a question on, on the chat from David Riley, can online participation be done accessibly and equitably? So I'll try and address that. At the same time, because I think um, you know, digital participation it, it, it is crucial. And going forward, it's just going to be more and more important to democratic innovation. That was one of the findings throughout the handbook. Is it's one of the key causes to the hybridization that I, that I was talking about. And people do have concerns about it not being as good as as face to face. Um, and th there are tensions there. But if you look at recent cases. Um, the Citizen Assembly of Scotland that um, uh, Kate's involved in, which went online at the weekend, as they were saying, and the Climate Assembly UK, um, where the, the, the last part of that went online as well. Then from what I saw of those, um, you know, they went online very, very successfully. They even went out of their way to make sure that everybody had uh, with the connectivity, you know, internet connection, a good device to connect had the skills to be able to use the software. And then once online, it was facilitated very similarly to face-to-face to, to -face and people seem to, 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 to be included. I mean, what I would say is, is those processes had already started offline. People had formed the bonds, they'd already met, they connected. Um, and whether you can get that with, when the whole process is done online, I'm not sure, but we'll also see the... Uh, Scotland have got their own climate assembly coming up, which I believe will be online. Um, my region, the uh, North Tyneside Combined Authority, are doing an online climate assembly um, this autumn as well. So um, we're in a better position to judge, but I think they absolutely can be done um, 
inclusively. In response to Ali, I think, yes, we do absolutely need to not just look at the stellar, exciting cases. We need to look at the boring, the everyday, the failures, absolutely. And actually, there's very good, two of the authors of the handbook of chapters in uh, uh, Palace, Baden and uh, Matt Ryan, and they've written a good article making exactly that point, and I, I would endorse that entirely. But I'd also sort of say I like the, I think the work that uh, Manny's been doing at the Scottish Parliament has been has been brilliant. There's some really exciting cases and I, that I've been researching, and some reports and articles will be on those will be following um, very soon. And I don't think I think actually getting the public to involve um, in in government scrutiny I think is really really important. I think that is a wow moment. It's a big moment. It doesn't all have to be leading directly um, to to policy. Um, and then, yeah, finally, Chris, the ham how, to, how to disseminate this to policymakers. I would like suggestions on this. Um, obviously, you don't send them a copy of the handbook. We need to find other formats, other ways to reach out to them. Um, Oliver and I are trying to do that. I know many members of the specialist group do the same. And I think you've got to say that the proliferation increase in democratic innovations going on around the world, we are succeeding in doing that, but there's a long way to go yet. Thank you, Stephen. That's great. Uh, in a second, I'm going to bring in Stephen Coleman um, because his hand is up. Um, please do put your hand up if you want me to add you to the list, and um, if, and, and also or give me a match through the chat. So I'll come to Stephen in a second. But I want to correct a little uh, a mistake I made earlier when I say that perhaps only Stephen and myself have read the full book in its totality. I can see that we've got Tamara Mujerin here, and she's, uh, she helped us, she was our assistant editor, who very patiently helped every co-author to, to improve the version um, that we got, the final version. So thanks to Tamara as well. Stephen, can I bring you in now? Apparently, apparently yes. the, the, the most common the most common um, expression this year is please unmute. Yes. Someone someone told me. People don't normally say that to me, but um, yeah, um, I really look forward to reading the handbook, and um, I want to make a comment, and then I want to ask a question. Uh, I wonder whether innovation. I wonder what proportion of the story innovation really is. And I wonder what proportion of the story disintegration is. That is to say, I wonder whether what we are seeing at the moment that makes what we're all working on so timely is not a good idea whose time has somehow come, but an enormous amount of bad process, institutional decadence whose time has passed. And so in very often what one is looking at is a kind of vacuum within what looks like innovation has to move in in some form. I just pass that as a comment. And then I have a question, and I don't expect you to answer this question now, but I would think it's a good question to think about. You talk about excessive expectations. And I wonder what you mean by excessive expectations. I wonder what the limit is that these expectations are exceeding. You know, because we, when we talk about something being excessive it means that there's a, a point and i think earlier on you talked about the point of reality and you pass that point of reality and you should no longer be there and i'm not at all clear about what any of that means i'm not sure about who determines that limit i'm not sure about whether it is a useful limit to work with for ex example if as part of the Scottish Citizens Assembly, they were to decide that they do not want Scotland to be an unequal country, if they were to decide they do not want to allow any corporation to operate there who break the law by avoiding taxation, is that an excessive expectation? Well, in terms of what's likely to happen in the next five years under the rather modest SNP government, it's an excessive expectation. But then I don't determine my expectations by what a Boris Johnson government finds realistic. I determine them by something else. So I, I'm kind of, I don't mind the thought that some of what happens 
as part of the participatory impulse results in frustration, that's something we should address. But sometimes the way to address frustration is not to say you've got to put up with frustration, it's to say you've got to get rid of what's frustrating. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, that's very helpful. I'm going to bring in uh, Ricky Ding and Matt Ryan in a second, uh, but I do want to warn our panel members and also Stephen that I'll come back to them pretty soon uh, to, to take on some of these points that have already been made. Uh, but first, let's hear from Ricky, please. Uh, hi. Oh, yeah. My internet is very bad today, so I'm going to leave the video off and you just have to hear me, not, not see me. Um, that's probably a bonus. Um, so yeah, I just want to chip in on this point about the dissemination of the handbook. And I think um, for me, there's a kind of question of who's the audience for this dissemination. The, the term policymakers um, is a bit vague as, for, as to who is being targeted here. Um, so I think one of the real strengths of the Democratic Innovations Handbook um, is that it has a whole section on the policy process, which is something that's generally been under um, researched in terms of democratic innovations. Um, and so when we talk about policymakers, are we talking about politicians? Are we talking about public administrators? Are we talking about some other audience? And how do we exactly target those people? Um, they may need different, different forms of communication and so on. So the way it was presented in the beginning um, was that democratic innovations are a solution to the problem of democratic malaise. I mean, is this really the problem that policymakers are dealing with? This seems very much targeted to the interests of politicians. It's about trust in politicians um, you know public administrators probably have quite different challenges that they're trying to address so targeting them with something about the democratic malaise might not be the right message um, so it'd be really interesting to hear from the panelists actually about who they think it should be targeted who they think should be targeted and how what the right messages will be for for those different audiences Thanks, Ricky. I'm going to come to Matt in a second, and I'm just going to flag up that I've got comments from Una, Anastasia, and Graham. So at some point, I'll come on to those, uh, or you may want to put your hand up and, and, and tell us yourself. But first, let's hear from Matt, and then I'm going to come back to the panel. Okay, thanks, Oliver. Thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, I've got, it's basically a question for Oliver and Stephen, because I'm really interested in how this subfield is developing. And uh, you've got this unique perspective on it, not only because you've actually read the book, I won't pretend to have read it all uh, yet, someday, and, uh, and, uh, also, but also you've had all these conversations with us via email, etc. And what I was wanted to know was, I mean, Stephen spoke to this a bit in his presentation, but what do you think has changed the most in, in the field from 2016 to 2020? And particularly I'm interested in was there anything that people wrote uh, that surprised you uh, or you felt was a really important learning perspective from your point of view? So I'd like to hear that reflection. That was all really. That's, that's great. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, let me perhaps start by coming back to you, Stephen, uh, and then any of the panel members who might want to pick up on, on some of the points. Stephen, can you pick up on maybe a couple of points? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I, I need to go back to that excessive expectation. That's some really good comments there, Stephen. Th thanks very much. I guess I go back to the example that I gave in the talk about people saying, let's have a, a citizen assembly on Brexit. Now, I think we could have had a citizen assembly on Brexit. We could have had one before the referendum, could have had one straight after the referendum. I don't think we could have had one when people actually start, or politicians actually started calling for it. By that point, it was too late. The, the debate was far too polarized. And I don't see really anybody agreeing to sign up to what came out of the assembly in advance of knowing what it was actually going to come up with. So I, I and I just think dropping, uh, I mean, there's other democratic innovations as well, but just to say this as an example, dropping the citizen assembly into that sort of heated, polarized atmosphere and expecting that it could resolve the situation that would then the assembly would make a decision about whether we did stay in the EU or not, or what, um, how we should leave if we were going to, et cetera, et cetera. And that everyone will go, okay, yeah, that's great. That's what we'll do then. It, that, was, that was too much. Now, I think the people calling for it weren't thinking, you know, the citizens assembly, this is a legitimate way of doing this. They were just thinking, 
we, I don't want to leave the EU. What can we possibly do to try and stop that happening? But I think with it then came, ex that's what I would call excessive expectation. Now you're right, it's not for me just to say what is the appropriate expectation and what isn't. But it comes from a combination of, of normative political theory and also empirical reality, a study of, of the cases, what can be about what is often achieved and, what, and therefore what can be achieved, the normative aspect about what should be achieved. And it needs to be an interplay between the two. And, you know, that's obviously always what I strive to do with my work. And I think that's what we sort of achieved throughout. If you take the handbook as a, as a whole, um, I think that we've achieved that in the handbook as well. Um, the, um, I'll leave the, um, the rest of the panel to respond to Ricky, I think. And then what's, ch Matt, what's changed from when we started to when we finished the book? That's a really good question. Um, I think the main striking thing for me has been the institutionalization, the fact that we are now seeing so many um, institutions trying to use and advocate for democratic innovations, you know, it's just increased rapidly, especially, I mean, at the moment in the UK, it's, it's, it's exploded really. So I think that, that's, been, that's been the biggest change. Uh, thanks, Stephen. I'm gonna ask panel members to give me a thumbs up if you got an, an answer or a point that you wanna make. Um, in reply to what's been said so far. And I have a growing list of people um, and comments to, to put to you. Um, I, I will, uh, while you have a think, Ali, Kate, and, and Chris, uh, if you wanna come in at this stage uh, to address Ricky's point or anything else that you have heard, I will uh, say something about Matt's question because, you know, to me, um, some years ago when, when many of us, I mean, there are people here in this room that have been in this field for many many years in, in some cases decades um, and in my case uh, you know it used to be uh, quite a challenge to explain to people what is it that we work on um, and uh, in our fields you know when you when you used to listen to that obscure band and you were in high school and uh, but then all of a sudden that band becomes uh, everyone's favorite and uh, and everyone talks about it and well it's been a little bit like that which to me because i have a bit of a contrarian spirit now i find myself um, uh, swinging towards the more critical side of things just because it's become more mainstream. And that's been a learning process um, in putting the handbook together. Um, there was, um, let me, can I bring in Kate perhaps or Ali or uh, Chris on uh, the point made by Ricky, who are the policy makers? I think mm -hmm. I might I might defer to my my panel. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can ask the audience. We got a you got the 50-50 option. They ask the audience <laughs> or, or call a friend. Uh, can I can I, Ali? Yeah. I mean, just briefly. I mean, in terms of the audience that I would look at, I suppose you the policymakers or the civil servants might be people that would be looking to utilize these innovations in order to you know involve the public in policy and so on and, and that's an angle maybe you want to look at the the practice and the benefits and so on and then obviously the other audience is the politician and i think without kind of beating them over the head about you know the democratic malaise and all the other kind of stuff whenever i've presented work to uh elected politicians uh, you know that relate to their committees it, they always obviously really like the you know the the outcome that comes from it having real people feeding in and you know they really find it valuable and I think maybe what's missing is just them seeing you know the level that's involved sometimes okay like in a standard engagement exercise you know many skilled uh, staff can do that kind of you know community conversation with their eyes closed but you know other things like you know deliberative processes and more involved digital engagement processes there's a lot of work that goes into that um, and it's not just a magic uh, you know uh, here's some opinion from the public so I think you know that would be the two different audiences you'd have to, to look at in terms of uh, garnering a greater understanding of democratic innovation. Okay. Can I, uh, so there was a point made by Una um, in the chat. Uh, so Una Miller is saying, by, by the way, hi Una, it's been a little while. Um, let me know if you wanna talk, but um, I'll, I'll read your point. Um, interested, uh, so Una is interested in how fast this area is evolving in Scotland. 
Um, but, and, and here is where um, governance context really matters, um, with a highly centralized uh, governance system in Scotland, well, the most centralized in the developed world, um, and how do these innovations uh, can become institutionalized throughout public life rather than in a meaningful way, rather than tokenistically? Um, which is one of the quintessential questions in the field, isn't it? And Ahmed Taleb um, follows Sunguna's comment by saying, you know, what are the, some of the recent examples of co-option? Um, you know, and, and I'm sure we all probably have examples, uh, so I invite you to throw them in um, if you are so inclined. Um, then um, another point that another question that has been um, asked by uh, Danica um, and uh, Danica perhaps you can come in actually it would be better if you kind of explain your point uh, um, yeah thanks um, I, I'm not sure if it was an entirely new point I was following up on Stephen Coleman's question I think um, and the question was it was picking up on this differentiation between expectations that are exceeding um, anything that would be reasonable and reasonable expectations, whatever that may be. And, and um, Stephen also already said a couple of points on that. And my, my question came from a similar direction, but maybe more from a normative perspective. So when would the normative expectations that we associate with democratic innovations be aspirational, which would be a good thing because usually we want to change democracy as soon as we're innovating democracy. And when would they be something like a utopian? But I think Stephen already addressed that in terms of um, yeah, the, the interchange also between empirical science. I would probably be interested also in the, in the role of practitioners and how they see themselves and feedbacking us as researchers or theorists on what is achievable or what is a reasonable expectation because I think this perspective is often what or is the thing that eludes us the most. <laughs> okay uh, and in the because time is going fast as it always does when you bring an interesting bunch of people to have an interesting conversation uh, I'm gonna have to kind of keep things a little bit tight and so what I'm gonna do um, I'm gonna pick up a few more points and then I'm gonna go back to the panel and Stephen and hopefully we can address some of them probably not all of them but again the conversation continues and uh, as you know we can um, connect by email Twitter and so on um, but uh, so before I come back to the panel, there are a couple of um, points that I would like to bring at this stage. Um, so Laura Berry is asking, um, um, Laura is interested in, in what the panelists and the authors think about the particular trend of citizens assemblies focused on climate change. And if that demonstrates that there is a particularly um, democratic and capacity deficit impacting existing institutions in governance lo at local, national, global level. Um, yeah, so what's going on with this um, fashionable trend of having assemblies on, on climate, on the climate emergency? So that's a question that I hope someone in the panel will pick up in the closing reflections. Um, we also got a, a, a question from uh, Graham Smith, and at this stage, I think I'm, I'm tempted to bring Graham in I hope I'm not putting you too much on the spot. If you're there, Graham, if, if you wouldn't mind coming in for 30 seconds and maybe putting that question to us and saying hi to everyone since you've been name checked quite a few times already. Yeah, it's slightly embarrassing, but thank you. Um, <laughs> they, actually, my, my question was a, was a slightly sarcastic question, but it was mostly trying to raise the, the you know, make it clear about how much work you've done. I wanted to know if Stephen and you knew how much work it would have taken to do this, would you have done it? Would you do it again? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Graham. I think we might, we might leave that one for the very, very end, and I'll say something on that as well. Um, and I think I have time just to pick up a question from Nibek. Um, so Nibek is saying, in regard to the idea of democratic innovations and deepening the role of citizens, uh, what should we judge this against? Uh, so what is a non-deep role? And how deep is deep enough? So how far, what do we mean when we are talking about deepening 
reimagining and deepening the role of citizens um, in policy making, in governance, in politics, which I think is also a helpful question for the final reflections. Uh, apologies if I've missed any other questions or points. Um, I will make sure I go back to the chat and review everything. And if everything hasn't been picked up, I'll, I'll try to follow up. But now I want to invite um, the final round of comments from the panel. And I think uh, I'm going to go with the order we used before. I'm going to start with Kate, then Ali, then Chris. We really just have 30 seconds, uh, 45 seconds each. Uh, then I'll come to Stephen and I'll say something before I hand over to Sonia. So, Kate, concluding reflections, and if you can build into it anything that has, um, any thought that has been sparked by some of the conversation. Okay, that's a difficult task, Oliver, but I'll, I'll try <laughs> and, and pick up um, a very rich uh, discussion. I think there's two things that are kind of coming out at me, is one, this, this, this pressure, this expectation idea, and this like, whole unpacking of that, um, you know, because I think one of the interesting things for me is that the Scottish Citizens Assembly has got values at the centre of it, and that's been seen as quite a, um, a challenging um, thing to, to, you know, uh, to kind of um, put together, but actually is looking at what um, Stephen Coleman is suggesting, in that you, you come up with how you want to live your life, not, not a kind of a, a derivative of somebody else's uh, already uh, refined. Um, Position um, and but I think I think the pressure uh, is also internally applied from my perspective by the uh, assembly members themselves because because they genuinely want to be good people and fix things as well so there's a kind of internal pressure happening happening I think um, so I saw uh, that the follow up question is yeah how, how maybe we should uh, ask people to reflect on on their um, their own expectations and it's also linked into um, the other items that Ali picked up that we're looking at the story uh, kind of you know wow we did this and then that happened and I think to persuade people to get involved and to give of their time we have referenced um, other uh, assemblies that have really made a, a kind of a seismic shift through luck judgment or um, combination of all those things and I think that also then uh, you know layers on um, Kind of ratchets everything up to to an un, unsustainable uh, place, and I think if we could, if we, I mean, my as a complete uh, kind of coming to this from from just one perspective, if this it's a this is a process, not not a product, and and I think the my fear uh, to to wind up is that the the, the citizens are become commodities, um, and they can be very easily um, used. I don't know if that's an answer or a reflection or just a general uh, kind of <laughs> I, think that's, consciousness. That's, I think that's very helpful and, and many people who are interested in how the Citizens Assembly of Scotland is working I think will be reassured by um, you know by the way you're thinking through these things so, so thanks Kate. Uh, can I come to you, Ali please? Yeah to kind of pick up the point on like you know how deep is your connection to the democratic process I think I think from one perspective, if, if somebody who would never in their wildest dreams ever think that they would connect with a democratic institution does so, even if it is to take five minutes to feed in their views on something and then that in turn feeds into the general, you know, well, just, just discursive sphere of a committee or, or whatever, then that is a, a good thing. But obviously the expectations that you would take from that, it's not that that five minute input is going to therefore define an entire law that's going to be written, but obviously in the round that sort of, you know, that's a positive thing. But on, on the other hand, if there is a, a real deepening in terms of the amount of effort that's put in around deliberative processes and so on, then, you know, you would maybe hope to expect that those kind of starrier things have some sort of impact about, you know, recommendations that are made and, and so on. On the point around why climate change is such a, you know, a, a, big, a big kind of topic for this stuff, I suppose, when we've been looking at it from our work and one of our citizen duties was related to climate change around land management and I suppose it's because it's a topic that kind of goes beyond party politics to a certain extent and there is no obvious answer and trade-off so it just lends itself really well uh, through the work we've done with Stephen Elstub we've kind of um, got a number of sort of uh, areas where we think these are quite good questions for deliberative processes and what I hope in the future now of course with Covid our face-to-face -face involvement is obviously Slow, um, slowed down a lot but as we come into the next session of parliament we're really looking at these are the types of questions and processes that if you have a committee are looking at this then there's an opportunity here yeah. some stuff. <laughs> so, sorry. 
That's all right. Okay. Uh, that's so anyway, right. Yeah. No, I think I, I think we got Patrick Scully uh, who needs to mute, please. Uh, but Ali, that, that actually was helpful because I was about to interrupt myself. Uh, you, I need to interrupt you uh, myself. Um, thank you, Ali. Uh, that was very helpful. Fifty-seven seconds, so twelve above the mark, but not too bad. And can I come to Chris, please, for your final uh, concluding thoughts? Yeah, I think um, the, the question about how, what do we judge this against and how do we determine success or moving forward is, is a really challenging question and something we should be quite cognizant of. Um, so when I spoke, I, I referred to quite a few numbers, but not the, the qualitative and the, the story and the, the real engagement process. And how do we measure that is, I, I, we don't know. Um, we're, we're working through that. Um, and also like working with the University of Edinburgh and uh, AI specialists to try to analyze this plethora of data in a way that we can demonstrate that everyone's voice has been heard. Um, but I think uh, back to Kate's question earlier about um, opportunities for digital. Um, I think we can really focus on accessibility and different methods and trying to engage as wide a group of as, as possible in ways that are meaningful um, and not just once one way all the time which I know the Scottish government has been guilty of through um, you know consultation by default um, so there's a lot of opportunities and um, I think that this handbook is such a useful resource and back to my question about how do we get policy makers and decision makers to to read it and to upskill them so that we can move towards more participative methods that's, me. yeah, that's great. Thank you, Chris. And I'm conscious that we are over time, although I've been told by the organizers that these webinars um, can run a little bit more. So we're just going to hold you for another five minutes, uh, a couple of minutes for myself and Stephen, and then three minutes for the webinar uh, hosts. Stephen. Thanks for all the um, comments and questions in the chat feed. I won't be able to respond to all of them, but just very, very briefly, I think some of the ones Oliver highlighted. One on institutionalization without to avoid corruption. We need rules on, on when the, these democratic innovations are, are used, and that applies for all of them, you know, mini publics, referendums, participatory budgeting. So it's not ad hoc, it's not just at the discretion of politicians to decide when and when we have it, but that there's rules there and that there's opportunities for the public to initiate these things as well as politicians initiating them. Deepening, I mean changing the role of, of the public from you know, standard representative democracy, not just choosing people to make decisions for you, but actively engaging in making those decisions and deliberating on them. Why climate change so popular? I think there's a number of reasons. I think, you know, the, the Irish case, I think, um, you know, there's a sort of element of policy transfer going on here, but it's democratic innovation transfer. So one London borough has a citizen assembly on climate change. Their neighbours think, oh no, we need to have it. Similarly, then there's like a domino um, effect. I think Extinction Rebellion have had an influence, um, but I also think it's because of the issue in that, you know, one of the downfalls of representative democracy is it's short termism, and this is a long term issue, needs long term thinking. And an assembly is actually a better place to, to do that than um, a parliament, I think. Thanks. Okay, and um, just a, a, a couple of parting thoughts from me. Uh, there have been some other questions on um, London Lime is asking about the more practical aspects of outreach. I'll be very happy to to uh, connect uh, beyond the session. There are some practical toolkits as well. Um, our handbook is more at that interface between research and practice, but happy to follow up. Uh, and let me, uh, my final thought will be then addressing Graham uh, Smith's question, which is, would I do it again? Um, I mean, I, I good, uh, I, I think. Um, will I do it? No, I won't. Uh, I don't know what I mean, but uh, I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, um, on the one hand, you cannot do this kind of thing unless you really have a very supportive community. We had that. We knew that if we created the space, people will help to populate it because you know they, there are a lot of people doing a lot of interesting work all over the place. Uh, but then again, we know that these days, uh, at least in, in the UK academic context, books are not as valued as, as they are 
for example, in Spain, which is where I come from. And um, so it's a labor of love. It's not something we can really do within our um, sort of normal workloads. And uh, uh, I, I've enjoyed and learned greatly and just the connections and the sense of what the field is doing and how it's evolving and how people are really taking very seriously the challenge um, of upgrading democracy, learning along the way, experimenting uh, and trying to take on some of the real uh, threats and challenges to democracy that, that are right now here with us and that are likely to accelerate in the next few years. So for me, it, it's been a, a, not just a learning experience, but also something that felt very meaningful um, and, and you know, a way of connecting to a lot of people doing a lot of interesting work. So I'm thankful for it. I don't think uh, I'll ever do anything as, as big as this. And I need to thank Stephen because he was the, the original, uh, he had the original idea and then we took it forward from that. But then again, everyone else who supported us along the way. Um, so that's gonna be all uh, from me. I'm gonna hand over to Sonia for the goodbyes. And um, I just wanna thank you all. I've just looked at the list of places and uh, I want to visit all these places, so I might get in touch with some of you now that we have become friends. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Oliver and Stephen. Uh, we're all very, very glad that you en embraced the challenge and produced this amazing handbook. So thank you. And also thank you uh, for uh, facilitating this brilliant discussion and to your fantastic panel. It was once again a super engaged audience. So another excellent webinar, and a brilliant way of uh, concluding this series organized by the group, um, which has enabled us to reach out uh, um, to um, where we never thought we could go. <laughs> and it was, it was brilliant uh, to see um, such good attendance every time. And I should say that I really enjoyed working with my colleagues and friends, uh, Danica, Anastasia and Hans on this series. It's been uh, um, really great teamwork so we're gonna be um we're gonna have there's a lot lot of activities planned as anastasia men mentioned at the start we're gonna be off zoom temporarily but not for too long because we're actually planning a new three-part webinar in collaboration with the democratic innovation steering group from the ecpr and the apsa related group on democratic innovation and um it's got a great title uh democracy rebooted um, classic concept for contemporary times and it's going to have a, an in-conversation format uh, with the PhD students or early career researchers and we've already secured participation from Graham Smith, uh, name checked once more, uh, who's going to discuss democratic innovations and, uh, and Jane Mansbridge who's going to talk about uh, discursive representation. So we don't have a date yet for that but we're going to send you an email and we're going to tweet about it on social media so stay tuned uh, so thank you all from me and i'm gonna uh, call on hans from some concluding remarks thank you bye well for me this actually only leaves uh to conclude this this webinar today and the webinar series so a lot has been said already i actually just want to thank everybody who participated today it was a fantastic webinar it was the best we could wish for and hope for for a final concluding webinar of the series. I would like to thank once again um, the co-organizers, Anastasia, Danica, and Sonia, who, who it was a pleasure working with on this webinar series. Um, and of course, we have to thank Rod Daycom, who actually put all these panels together that um, these webinars were based on. So Rod has a big, a big, um, had a big role in all of this. Um, yeah, so once again, thank you all for participating. It has, has been a real pleasure. It's, um, we, we tried to make the best out of this crisis, basically, and, uh, you know, used our resources to keep the community going, keep the discussion going, and to reach out. And it has enabled us to reach out to places where we could otherwise not reach. We had participants from Hong Kong, from Australia, and many other places around the world. So it has been a real pleasure. Thank you all, and we'll see you all again in our upcoming collaboration with the two Democratic Innovation Standing Groups. Um, so there are just uh, exciting discussions coming up. Have a great evening, and thank you all. <laughs>